Welcome. This series of videos is going to cover drowning. And we'll look at how to recognize it, how to rescue patients, as well as how to treat it in the emergency department. And the World Health Organization categorizes drowning as respiratory impairment from either submersion or immersion in some sort of liquid. So submersion refers to whenever the airway goes below the surface of the liquid. And immersion is when water gets onto the face, uh, such as when you've got your head in a bucket. So submersion tends to be drowning in pools or uh, bodies of water, whereas immersion can happen in buckets or even toilets. Drowning can also be uh, categorized as either fatal or non-fatal. Non-fatal drownings are ones in which the patient is rescued at any time. Uh, and fatal drowning means that they die at some point. And the non-fatal ones may have no morbidity or they may have morbidity. Now, let's say you have someone who gets submerged or is immersed in water, but there is no respiratory impairment, then we call that uh, a water rescue. So next, let's discuss who is at risk for drowning. What are the risk factors? So let's do this by taking a look at the prototypical drowning victim. Most of them are males, and African-American males are at greater risk possibly because they don't take swimming lessons as often as other ethnicities. And similarly, lower income patients and those living in rural areas, presumably because they don't have as much access to swimming pools as well in order to learn, either because of the money or because they're not living near one. Toddlers tend to fall victim to buckets, bathtubs, and toilets such as that, like in the picture we drew of the immersion injury. Young adolescents are at greater risk when alcohol is involved or risky water sports like water skiing or jumping off of uh, cliffs or diving into shallow water, in which times they can get spinal cord injuries. And for the elderly, those with heart disease are at greater risk, and they also tend to die in the bathtub. Uh, another two important things that are important to mention, number one, are those who have prolonged QTs because cold water can further prolong the QT causing dysrhythmias. The other people who we have to worry about are those with epilepsy because if they have a seizure when they're in the water either swimming or even taking a bath they can also drown. Next let's talk about the process of drowning or the pathophysiology of drowning. Now when patients drown on TV it's a highly visible behavior. They're splashing and shouting and screaming for help. It's a very, making very violent movements, and it's, it's obvious that they are in distress. This is actually called aquatic distress, and this is not drowning. That's not how patients drown. What actually does happen when they are about to drown is they start becoming a lot less, uh, a lot more still and a lot n less noise, make less noise. Uh, and it can actually look like to the untrained person that the patient is swimming calmly. Because they don't get enough air in, they don't have the energy to be splashing around and screaming. Instead, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be pushing down with their hands. What they're actually trying to do, and this is an involuntary movement, is trying to push themselves up to get their head above water. They're usually going to be vertical in position, and they might have be kicking their legs just a little bit. Uh, this lasts about 20 to 60 seconds before they go under the water. And so there have been reported cases of people who are swimming right next to someone who was actually drowning. They didn't even know because the patient, the person was so calm, and then they went under. So lifeguards are actually trained to recognize this instinctive drowning response because when you reach this part where you look so motionless and you're just barely moving, that's when you're really about to drown. So after the instinctive drowning response, then the patient is now entering the, the process of drowning. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to hold your breath in order to prevent water from getting into your airways. But at some point, your air hunger is going to overcome your ability to hold your breath, and you're going to start gasping. And then you're going to start to swallow water. Now, whether this is salt water or fresh water, it really makes no difference it's going to cause the same damage. Sure, the salt water is going to be more osmotically 
active and maybe cause some shifts, but that's not what's going to kill you. It's the water in the wrong place. That whole compartment shifting thing doesn't happen until you get about 11 milligrams per kilo uh, of water, but you're going to aspirate maybe about 4 mLs per kilo usually. Now, on the other hand, dirty water does matter. If there's all kinds of mud, sewage, or bacteria in there, that could be a problem because it can cause infections. And the little particulates, whether it's mud or sewage or whatever, that can go and plug your bronchioles. So dirty water is a bad thing. So most of the water that you swallow is actually going to go into your stomach. And that's not such a big deal. After all, we drink water all the time. It's the water that you actually aspirate and gets into your lungs. That could be a big problem. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that water in your stomach is not going to be a problem later. Since most patients who, who, whose stomach is full with water are going to vomit at some point. And they're going to be unconscious when they vomit, and then they're going to aspirate that. And so that's why the water in the stomach can be a problem. So let's talk about what happens to that aspirated water. So that water that gets into the lungs, whether it's fresh water or salt water, it doesn't matter. What it's going to do is get into the alveoli and wash out the surfactant, which can lead to alveolar collapse. And in those alveoli that are full with water, Oxygen exchange can't occur here, so now you're going to get shunting. And of course, now we have pulmonary edema. So all of this respiratory badness is going to lead to cardiovascular collapse and eventually death. And the other things that we have to worry about is hypothermia, because you tend to drown in water that's colder than your body temperature, and then you're going to your body temperature is going to drop. And so that's the entire process that takes place. Basically, you start out in the water, you have your instinctive drowning response, your mouth goes under, you try to hold your breath, but you can't. Water gets in your stomach, water gets in your lungs, it disrupts your lungs. You eventually get cardiovascular collapse and hypothermic. So obviously not all patients who uh, drown die. Can we predict who's going to do worse? And no scoring system is, is perfect, not in anything. No scoring system will ever be perfect. But there are some things that you could look for, and things that we worry about are the age, water temperature, duration, and the effectiveness of the rescue attempt and the subsequent resuscitation. So uh, obviously kids are more prone to uh, injury. Number one, their, their body surface area is, is bigger, so they're more prone to hypothermia. They have a stronger diving reflex, so that might help them, that might shunt blood to their heart and their brain. The colder the temperature of the water is, the more likely you're going to become hypothermic. Now, hypothermia does prevent CNS injury. In fact, we use that to our advantage in certain resuscitations in emergency medicine. However, in drowning, it does worsen dysrhythmias. And obviously, the longer that you're under the water, the less likely you are to survive. So patients who've been in less than five minutes have a 10% fatality rate. Ten minutes jumps up to 56%. 11 to 25 minutes, 88%. And those more than 25 minutes have nearly 100% fatality. Now, hypothermia does mitigate this a bit. We've all heard of those cases of uh, people who fell into ice water who have been underwater for an hour who, or two hours or even longer who were successfully resuscitated. So these are estimates. And finally, the effectiveness of rescue or resuscitation. So those patients who took more than 10 minutes in order for CPR to get started, uh, they do worse. So that ends this first video on drowning, and we talked about the pathophysiology. Uh, but in the next one, we're going to talk more about the treatment. So that includes rescue as well as treatment pre-hospital and in the emergency department. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, have a good day. Bye.